Forget the keys to the city. We'll take the keys to the toy box. That's this week on Motoring 2000. SN's Motoring 2000 is brought to you by Quaker State Motor Oils, formulated for the vehicles you drive and the way you drive them, and Midas Car Care, the way it should be. Well, last week we promised you that we would be at the largest car showroom in North America. Well, this is it, Shannonville, Ontario, site of the annual Test Fest conducted by the Automotive Journalists Association of Canada. And you know, every single new model for the year 2000 is here. Well, there are a couple of exceptions. We'll tell you more about that later. But what started out as nothing more than a social get-together has turned into one of the most important dates on the Canadian automotive calendar. <laughs> As far as we know, there isn't anything else anywhere in the world quite like it. That, that, uh, one of the things that's quite unique is getting all the manufacturers together on the same site with each other. And, uh, and, and they find some benefit in that too. The Elantra wagon offers a cargo volume of 1,784 liters. This also makes it tops in its class for cargo volume. And safety as well is an added feature always that people do look into when purchasing a station wagon for their family. Essentially we've tried to group the cars together in, in uh, sort of a competitive areas so that you're comparing apples to apples and so there are uh, sports coupes and sports sedans or one segment and prestige cars when you get up over the sixty thousand dollar range pretty much everything is a, a prestige element so they're grouped together. Economy cars under eighteen thousand five hundred uh, family cars, the you know your basic sedan, and we've put a price break there at 25, so we've got over and under. And uh, we need a, a, at least three vehicles within a class before we'll evaluate it as a class. What we want when we come here, of course, is to win an award, and then uh, the usage that you can make out of that is in advertising, you know, bringing people into the showroom with an award-winning vehicle. Um, I mentioned earlier on that uh, even we use it worldwide as well too. Uh, our parent company in Japan will make use of it in uh, Australia or Chile or uh, over in Europe as well. So it's a, it's a big deal for us to win down here. A few years back we decided not to participate. Uh, we thought the, the testing was a little too subjective. There wasn't, um, there wasn't leeway in there to, to talk about price. So if you had an expensive product versus a, a cheaper product, uh, you know, the halo would go to the more expensive product because of the more content in the vehicle. But today, and well, over the years it's evolved, um, there's more of a scientific um, engineering approach to this. So we've got a, a level playing field here where a car can, can win on its own merits. Do you feel you have to be here now? Uh, I think if you're not here, um, it's probably a, a sign of um, maybe, a, if, you're, if you're confident enough in your products, you'll be here. Toyota has not entered the past two years for reasons of their own. Uh, I wouldn't presume to speak for them. Uh, everyone else either is here or has is not here for a specific reason. Volvo, for example, had an entry that they had to withdraw because it wouldn't satisfy our on-sale date of December 1st. It was delayed in terms of getting here. Uh, Suzuki had, uh, had some entries that, that they withdrew uh, in favor of some newer product coming next year. And I think everyone else that has eligible product is here. Well, I don't think anything's perfect, but I think this comes about as close as you can can get. Uh, everything's rated on a scale of one to ten. Uh, all of our parameters are arrived scientifically. Uh, we've done as much as we can to take a subjective attitude out of it. In that respect, it's not a popularity contest, as so many awards are. Second to your motoring awards, uh, Brad, uh, it's probably the most uh, important and prestigious uh, 
awards that uh, we have as, uh, as a manufacturer to, to look forward to. We'll definitely make the cut. Thanks. <laughs> the environmentally friendly car. Biodegradable and it's getting lighter with age, which means better fuel economy. More later on Kenzie's Corner. Can you tell him he's been a bad boy? If he is, he's been a very bad boy. <laughs> You want to see me handcuff him? Yeah, I'd love to. <laughs> I'd love to. <laughs> That's great. Thanks okay. a lot. Thanks a lot. See you guys. Bye bye. Cheers. Seldom do we get as many requests to review a specific vehicle on test drive. Well, this is it, the Dodge Viper. <laughs> the Viper's key element is what motivates it. This monstrous 8-liter V10 pushes no fewer than 450 horsepower out to the back wheels. And trust me, it makes for one hell of a ride. When combined with a phenomenal 490 pounds-feet of torque, a number that shows up for work right from the word go, the result is simply unbelievable. Even with the 33530 ZR18 tires delivering tremendous grip, overpowering them, even in the dry, is just all too easy. Do anything more than breathe on the loud pedal and you become a landlocked missile, one that blasts through the 100k mark in second gear in a spine-tingling 4.2 seconds. But that's not where it stops. 80 to 120 takes but a couple of ticks and the Viper runs the quarter mile in under 12 and a half seconds with a terminal speed of around 185 kilometers an hour. Fast only begins to describe this car. The frustration is that the power output is so prodigious that it's all but impossible to use at least if you value your life and license. The other drawback is that at everyday speeds, the Viper is an awkward car to drive, primarily because the gas pedal is so sensitive. Setting the correct driving position is a simple matter. First of all, set the steering wheel. You then move the seat so that the relationship between the wheel and your body is right. Then just reach down under here, twiddle a little knob, and you can move the pedals up and down so that they are now placed in the right position. It's that simple. Matched with the motor is a six-speed manual box that's remarkably refined. The throws are short, the gate well defined, and the clutch light and progressive. Actually getting into sixth gear, though, is a task because at 140 kilometers an hour, the motor ticks over at just 1,700 RPM. Stopping power comes from a huge set of vented rotors with four piston calipers up front. The system is effective, fade resistant, and remarkably easy to modulate. On the skid pad, it took just 107 feet to stop from 80K. Perhaps the most surprising part about the Viper is the fact that there is no electronic gadgetry. In other words, no ABS, no traction control, and no dynamic stability control of any form. Now, from a strictly purist standpoint, that's a wonderful thing. After all, who wants an electronic co-pilot sticking his nose in mid-drift on a racetrack? The reality of the situation is, however, this is a street legal car and those items would have been the safety blanket it needs. The chassis is a racing inspired tubular space frame with a strong spine. The result is a platform that is both structurally rigid and provides a good base of operations for the fully independent double wishbone suspension. The design employs coil over coney shocks. While very firm in nature, there is just enough compliance to make the ride tolerable. On the skid pad, the Viper is devoid of body roll and throttle-induced oversteer aside is reasonably balanced to the feel. The steering is also razor sharp, requiring very little input to change direction. Great on the track, but as with the motor, it's just too quick for everyday use. The other drawback is that over rough roads, the car suffers from bump steer and needs constant correction to maintain the desired line. You know, if there is such a thing as the knuckle-dragging Neanderthal of the automotive world, the Viper is perhaps it. Having said that, there are 450 phenomenal reasons to love this car.
Time to say goodbye to our Saturn, which has been a big favorite in the long-term garage. On the plus side, it's simply a good-looking car. Now, on the practical side, the third door is simply a treat. Gives you all the benefits of a sedan while keeping its coupe design. Service has also been exceptional. Now, on the downside, while the ride is smooth on the highways, it's not very good over rougher terrain. You feel every single bump. And finally, the front seats. I've got a back that aches just thinking of a long drive, but with these side bolsters keeping you snug, it's indeed an enjoyable ride. And we recommend this vehicle on your shopping list. Our Midas Tip of the Week concerns automatic transmissions. We're often asked if it's a good idea with an automatic transmission to take it out of drive or out of gear when you're sitting at a traffic light. No, it isn't. Leave it in gear for a number of reasons. First of all, you have to be able to move on a moment's notice or make an evasive maneuver. And taking it out of gear is just going to waste some time. For example, if you realize that you're just about to get rear-ended, you might want to turn right and go into that parking lot or over the curb onto the grass to avoid getting rear-ended. Secondly, you've got to be able to move quickly when traffic resumes and it's just too easy to forget that it's still in neutral and hit the gas, the engine revs flare up, you get embarrassed and then try and pull it into gear while it's still revved up and that'll do more in wear, wear and tear to the transmission than it ever would leaving it in gear. So just leave it in gear. The only exception is if you're stuck in traffic in the summertime and you're boxed in in traffic, obviously going nowhere for a long time, then you can put it in neutral or park let it idle for a minute, apply the emergency brake, and shut it off until it looks like traffic's ready to move again. That's your Midas Tip of the Week. For many years, car manufacturers have spent millions of dollars on trying to make their vehicles safer for those inside. Yet unbelievably, many drivers and passengers still refuse to wear their seat belts. In such a problem, police forces across the nation actually have to remind drivers of the tragic consequences. What we're having Operation Impact is what we're trying to do is once a year we try to make people aware of what's going on in the area, to make people more aware of you should be wearing your seat belt for safety factors and we have more officers that are going out and around and making people aware of what's going on. We have a rollover vehicle, which was donated to us by GM. We took this rollover vehicle and we put it onto a trailer and we simulate what it's like at 40 kilometers an hour if you're in your vehicle not wearing your seatbelt. It's fairly graphic. Usually what happens is the mannequin that's inside will fly out. We do two demonstrations. We do one with the mannequin hooked up with the seat belt showing what will happen. It still moves around. We also have a baby in a baby seat. It's not hooked up properly. Most people we're finding nowadays are just taking the, the baby seat, putting it right into the vehicle without hooking it up properly and it also demonstrates that. The other one is the seat belt convincer. It goes approximately 8 kilometers an hour and comes to a dead stop. And I'll show you what the impact is like at 8 kilometers an hour. What is it? I mean, you meet people, I'm sure you find people who aren't wearing the seatbelt. Why do some people still resist wearing their, their seatbelt? Is there an answer? I don't think there is a real answer for that. Uh, some people will talk and say, my uncle or my brother or somebody I know would have lived if they were not wearing their seatbelt because they would have been thrown. This is not true. I couldn't say that everybody will ever wear all their seat belts all the time. It would be nice. It'd make our job easier at times. This is the brand new Cadillac DeVille. And Cadillac is hoping to attract a younger buyer through added performance and offering a better looking car. But the fact of the matter is most people who buy this car are age 60 and over. But nonetheless, the company is adding some brand new advanced technology to the DeVille that should appeal 
to all ages and we'll show it to you later on but we have to wait until the sun goes down so stick around but right now we're going to head to the garage and join Bill Gardner We've got some mail this week from Mike Sanford in Edmonton. He wants to know a couple of things. First of all, about washer fluid. He's got the uh, summer washer fluid in his van, and he wants to know if he should drain it out. The summer stuff is that pink colored fluid, and it doesn't have the freeze protection that he's going to need in Edmonton, or for that matter, anywhere else in Canada. So Mike, you've got to drain it out. And he asks about the easiest way to do it. The easiest way is just to get a little cheap plastic piece of hose and siphon it out into a bottle. You could reuse it next summer if you want but you've got to have that blue stuff in there for the winter that's got the freeze protection you need. Now the good news is that all the components in the washer system are either plastic or rubber hoses, plastic bottle uh, and pump and usually rubber hoses. So even if it does freeze, it usually doesn't damage anything, it doesn't break things, but it won't work when you need it most. So drain it out while it's still liquid and get the blue stuff in there for the winter. Second part to the question concerns weather strips. That's these weather seals around the doors and should you apply anything to them? Well, the best product that I found is to put 303 protectant on them or you could use something like Armor All. You want something nice and light that'll soak into those things and keep them from freezing and keep them from, uh, from tearing. These weather strips are quite expensive. $100 or more per door to weather strip a door is not uncommon. They don't look like much, but boy, they're pricey. So try and keep them in good shape in the last life of the vehicle. Till next week, I'm Bill Gardner for Motoring 2000. If you're big into cars, check out MotoringTV.com and while you're at it, download a copy of Autopilot. Autopilot software searches out the matches to your automotive interest and makes the most of your online time. Look at this car, ain't she a beauty? 83 Pontiac Grand Lemon. Yeah, she's a champ, you know. This is the kind of car that journalists drive when they have to pay for it themselves. The people that write the checks in this business take the term freelance a bit too literally. My concept of expensive Lance journalist just hasn't caught on quite the way I'd hoped. But you know, for me, this car's perfect. It's cheap, it starts, and it won't be stolen. I mean, what thief would be caught dead in a car like this? Now you can see that it's seen better days. There's a bit of rust here and there. and Actually, the subframe under there has had a bit of a problem. GM's involved in a lawsuit in the United States because those subframes tend to rust and the gas tank falls out. There's been a $4.9 billion judgment against them. But you think about that for a minute. Some of these cars are over 25 years old. Guess what? Cars rust. Most of the contemporaries of these cars have all since, long since evaporated. So GM basically is being sued because they almost built a car that lasted forever. If it had lasted forever, they'd be home free. If it had broken down a thousand years ago, they'd be home free. Crazy. Now that judgment surely is going to be overturned on appeal, but even that's not the stupidest lawsuit I've ever heard of. Parents of a young boy in Connecticut sued the Bell Helmet Company because their son was turned into a vegetable in a motorcycle crash. Their point was not that the kid was wearing a Bell Helmet, because he wasn't, but that Bell didn't advertise the superiority of their product strongly enough to encourage their son to spend the extra money for the better helmet. Fortunately, the trial judge threw them out on their ear, but some lawyer somewhere thought that might be a winnable proposition. Only in the United States. Thank God for that. I'm Jim Kenzie. We're back behind the wheel of this new Cadillac DeVille, and as I mentioned earlier, Cadillac has installed some new advanced technology into this vehicle that can be only demonstrated when the sun has set, because it's called night vision. And I can see up ahead to the right a car, person waving their hand. Night vision is a technology that allows you to see things beyond the range of the headlamps from uh, three to five times that range uh, during the dark of night that you wouldn't normally see. The camera is located in the grill right in the very front of the car, right in the middle, and it shines straight ahead and picks up all the objects where your headlamps would normally shine and it's directed the way the car is, uh, is targeted. It uh, senses a difference in thermal energy, which is the heat given off by an object. Anything that's a different heat, it picks up different shades of color, and then it uh, 
projects that in the windshield and little viewing area that uh, the customer can look at and uh, it enhances what he sees down the road. So everything directly in front of you, the camera will, uh, will pick up. For the, uh, as I said, three to five uh, times the uh, distance that a normal headlamp and for a uh, wider scanning view. Yes, it is new technology, but the trick with new technology is to make, add value and to make it passive so that a person doesn't get shocked or scared by it. And of course, that's what this is. You know, it's like your rear view mirror. It's going to be there. Uh, you just glance at it occasionally and uh, it just enhances. And of course, if you're in a, uh, an uncomfortable situation like snowstorm or fog, uh, you're really concentrating and uh, if this is out there and you just occasionally glance at it like you would a rear view mirror, uh, it really uh, gives you that uh, extra sense of insurance and once you've experienced it, uh, you won't want to uh, back away from it. Incidentally, night vision technology, oh wait a minute, you can't see me, I'm in the dark, so let's turn on the night vision. There. Can you see me now? Anyway, as I was saying, this technology is the same used by the military in the Gulf War. But the big question is now, will consumers adapt to it in their vehicles? Well, General Motors is convinced they will. In fact, they've already taken a poll, and 9 out of 10 moose have given night vision the thumbs up. How about that? Well, that's it for now. We'll see you next week as we continue to bring you more stories about cars and the people who drive. You know, perception's a hard thing to, uh, to battle against, and, and the perception uh, that was in the Canadian consumer's mind of Hyundai was, was one that, uh, that we weren't uh, real happy with or, or proud of. Well, if you're a 25-year-old and just got married, you've got a kid on the way and signing your first mortgage, this isn't a forgotten segment. I mean, this is your segment, and, uh, and that's important to remember. This is the first time a uh, uh, new car buy for many, many people. Not everybody's buying sport utilities right out of uh, college. So it's very, very important. I think. The uh, Insurance Institute for Highway Safety conducted some um, fairly elaborate tests, 64 kilometer uh, per hour offset crash test with 15 compact sport utilities and the M-Class came out shining colors. In fact, it rated the best. TSN's Motoring 2000 has been brought to you by Quaker State Motor Oils, formulated for the vehicles you drive and the way you drive them. And Midas Car Care, the way it should be.